I also think it's a reminder of the fact that we shouldn't be complacent at all about terrorist attacks in Europe now. Uh, Gaza is really radicalizing opinion. We've had a, a few years in which there's been less visible big terrorist attacks in Europe, but this colonial cathedral attack, the attempt in Holland, it's very likely that we will begin to see more attacks happening in Europe and, and people will attempt to mount attacks in the United States again. So uh, one of the things... Welcome to the rest of Politics Question Time with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. Now, one of the big stories that we didn't cover in the main podcast was the terrorist attack in Moscow. So let's start with that, Rory. Aaron K. Wilson, what is your take on why ISIS-K attacked Russia? Tim Harries, how will the Moscow concert attack affect the war in Ukraine? So you want to have a go at that one? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, I think one thing that maybe people haven't focused on enough is that the attackers were almost certainly Tajiks from Central Asia, so from a little country that's on the northern edge of Afghanistan. And it's complicated for a number of reasons. One is that Tajiks seem to be increasingly radicalized and involved in terrorist attacks around the world. There's a lot of uh, activity, partly because ISIS is struggling to survive in Afghanistan. The Taliban have been pushing them back. They've been a kind of rival terrorist group. They've been recruiting a lot in Tajikistan. About 4,000 Tajiks went to join ISIS when it had this caliphate across the Iraqi-Syrian border. And they seem to have been involved in a spate of recent attacks, including an attack that was foiled to attack Cologne Cathedral, Germany, attack in Holland, and now more re most recently this attack uh, in Moscow. Uh, it's really complicated. It's very complicated because on the one hand, uh, there are very close economic connections between Russia and Tajikistan. The largest Russian non-naval base in the world is in Tajikistan. Uh, there are well over a million Tajiks living in Russia, huge numbers of remittance payments going back, people sending cash back to their families from Russia to Tajikistan. But this is likely to lead to a big clampdown on Tajiks living in Russia. Um, and on the other hand, of course, one of the things that may be driving this is because there is quite a large Tajik community and because they often feel that they're treated as second-class citizens in Russia, it's a potential breeding ground for terrorist attacks uh, against Russia. I suspect that's one of the reasons why they displayed yesterday the four guys that they arrested. They displayed them yesterday in court, surrounded by dozens of cameras, and they had clearly been tortured, beaten up, call it what you want. There was one guy who had, he had a huge bandage where apparently his ear had been severed. There was another guy, I don't know if you saw it, Rory, he could, couldn't open his eyes. There were sort of, you know, black eyes and bulging, uh, bulging temples where, so I think that that was a deliberate message saying, okay, these guys got away with it in that they managed to kill a lot of people, but this is what happens if you decide to go down that route. And I guess, I guess the other interesting element to this is the fact that Putin and the Kremlin so quickly tried to link the events to Ukraine without any seeming evidence at all. Um, so I suppose that shows also the, 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 the Putin, whatever happens, whatever is happening that he doesn't control, he tries to link it to the things that he think he can control. It, it's very complicated, isn't it? Because the um, you're exactly right. W when I first heard about it, I thought, well, maybe this is Ukraine connected. Um, but it completely complicates the strategic narrative mm. in Russia because um, everything was meant to be about Russia saving world civilization through its fight against Nazis in Ukraine. And suddenly now it's back to terrorism, Chechnya, the war in Syria, and all this kind of stuff, which, um, and again, it it's interesting. I mean, Putin used Chechen attacks in Moscow, paradoxically, to really drive his popularity up because it then led to this very brutal campaigns in Grozny. So it's going to be interesting to see whether people feel as they might that he's taken the eye off the ball and he's not doing his job properly, or whether he manages yet again to try to make his brutal response part of his sales mm, pitch. Mm. I also think it's a reminder of the fact that we shouldn't be complacent at all about terrorist attacks in Europe now. 
uh, Gaza is really radicalizing opinion. We've had a, a few years in which there's been less visible big terrorist attacks in Europe, but this Cologne Cathedral attack, the attempt in Holland, it's very likely that we will begin to see more attacks happening in Europe and, and people will attempt to mount attacks in the United States again. So th th there's, there's one of the things that we were talking about in this great leading interview with the ex-head of MI6 and MI5, which is coming out quite soon, I was talking about the way that these intelligence agencies, particularly our foreign intelligence agencies, switched after 9-11 to put more and more emphasis on counterterrorism instead of their traditional work. And then to some extent, they've sort of flipped back and they're focusing much more on things mm. like Russia and Ukraine. Um, I, I fear we're going to have to get back to a world where we're putting more resources into counterterrorism. Yeah, I think people will be interested in just how frank John Soares, the ex MA6 guy, and Eliza Manning and Buller, who ran MI5, just how frank they are about some of the issues we talk about. I mean, for example, Eliza, absolutely crystal clear that she sees what's happening in Gaza as catastrophic in terms of the radicalization of a generation. And that we and other, every other country in the world will have to deal with that down the track. Also, very, very, very strong views about about Trump as well. So that is one to look forward to. Now, Rory, last week, yes, we we talked about free ports and special economic zones. Yeah. And hmm. do you remember Anna Turley? Was she in Parliament at the same time as you? Uh, I, I I know her, but I don't think in Parliament at the same time. Okay, well, she she was MP for Redcar, and she's standing again in Redcar, and she starts off very nicely. Rory. She says, "I'm a big fan of Rory's." But uh, yeah, the bus is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Found myself disappointed in his uncharacteristic lack of intellectual curiosity on the Freeport and Teesside. He seems to dismiss the issue as a situation where the government has been ripped off and out negotiated. But what happened here is that a huge site in public ownership after compulsory purchase was turned into 50 50 joint venture project with a couple of businessmen with close links to the mayor, after no procurement process, no tendering opportunities for any other businessman. How can you assess value for money without a tendering process? This was then turned into a 90-10 joint venture with no publicity and no scrutiny. And there was a piece in the Financial Times about their profits, these business guys, uh, absolutely soaring. So Anna goes on, contracts are going to family members. We see the developers buying stately homes worth three million, their sons swanning around Teesside in Rolls Royces, while we have some of the biggest child poverty rates in the country. And so I guess she's making the point I was trying to make that this isn't just about business. This is about a new system, new systems which are which are tipped towards this kind of, I'd call it kind of cronyism, as opposed to proper tendering anti-corruption processes yeah well I, I look i i'm not a i'm not in favor of these things i think um you know that this is where i follow my my hero david gork that mm. if if there are good reforms that you need to make to get the economy going and if there's too much red tape and too many regulations too much planning getting in the way of business be brave and do it across the whole country don't create these little islands where you try to change the rules um but yeah. i guess what what's going on behind it is this question of how you get the balance right because as you point out at the same time as it's absolutely true that there seems to be shocking examples here um we also know that britain is unbelievably bad at launching anything building any infrastructure getting anything done and that's partly because our processes our planning rules our tendering procedures are unbelievably slow and bureaucratic which is why you know you often make jokes about the fact they were talking about the third runway when you came in in 97 this guy ben houchen though he's clear he's clearly an operator um he had <laughs> there was i didn't see question time but people were uh amused slashed angered at the fact that there was a woman in the audience last week who was talking about a wonderful man ben houchen was and it turned out that she's the wife of one of his colleagues there we uh, are. He you was see, also sitting, bit like, sitting in the audience. Bit, bit so like you being nice about Keir Starmer. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Well, you, presumably she's, a, she's she's related to a colleague. It's like you being nice about Keir Starmer. Yeah, but I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go and pretend to be a sort of random member of the public in a question time audience. I suppose, I suppose the danger is yeah, exactly, exactly. You, yeah, 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 that's yeah, true. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Right. Um, here, look, Tasmania election. Something that's that you know a lot about, Erin. I've just turned eighteen. Be voting for the first time in a state election just over a month away, Tasmania is the only state in the country with a liberal government still in power. So it'd be fascinating to see how this plays out. 
Tell us about what's happening in Tasmania. Well, they've had the election and uh, very interesting. The So it is the only state in the country with a Liberal government, and that's their Tories, as it were. Um, but they've not done very well. They've, they've taken a bit of a hit. However, the Labour opposition weren't the main beneficiaries. The main beneficiaries were smaller parties and independents. Um, so it's now going to be some sort of coalition that gets cobbled together. Um, so I don't know how you voted, Erin, um, but that was a very, very, very interesting election. I, had it gone to Labour, it would have meant that Australia was uh, red, as in Labour, at the federal level and in every single state, uh, which would have been quite a thing. Um, so Tasmania, probably still going to be a Liberal Premier, um, but with a pretty shaky coalition. Very good. Now, Rory, what about this one? Um, you are, I, I don't want to be too hard on you because, you know, but given you did give Rachel Reeves a bit of a kicking, I don't feel too bad about it. Um, the other place where you were getting a lot of pushback last week was what you said about the health service. Ooh. So now here's one. Jim Down, Rory seems convinced that investment is not the problem with the health service and that reform offers the solution. But in the new Labour years, we were ranked first by the Commonwealth Fund, the head of Europe, America, Australia, etc. Since then, our cumulative underspend, even including COVID spending uplift, is $322 billion. Innovation, data, AI, etc. is vital, but changing the system will be expensive and it's changed one set of problems for another. Aren't the big picture answers ultra-processed food taxes to reduce chronic illness and a more preventive approach. P.S. Healthcare does not meet the requirements for a successful marketplace, not even close. Well, I mean, I think he's absolutely right about uh, the fact that even if you look around the world and you see systems that seem to be doing better, you know, sometimes people, for example, envious of France or envious of Australia, mm. changing to one of those systems would be incredibly painful and i can really mm. see the argument to say that we're not starting from the same place and that trying to shift midway is almost impossible he's also right that the nhs the way it's currently run desperately needs more money and it runs much better when there's much more money given to it i guess where we part company is about where the government's going to get that money from Mm. And at mm. the expense of what? Because I think that's where such a job is point that if you look at the the CDL, which is the kind of flexible bit of government spending, we've gone up from 27% being spent on the NHS to 45%, about to get up to 50. But that, isn't that though, because that NHS is one of the few budgets that was not frozen. So most of the other budgets during austerity were frozen. Absolutely. So it's a higher and higher proportion. But of course, he, he's implying that we need to put much more money in and, and, it's true that was a big, uh, you know, the increase in real terms, which is what um, Osborne and Cameron were talking about, was nothing like enough because uh, health inflation is always a few percent above normal inflation because as we get mm. older, there's more and more people needing treatment and drugs get more and more expensive. So I, I, I think there's no doubt that one way of solving it would be to try to do what Gordon Brown did, which is just put an enormous amount more money into the system, except that there would probably be quite a lot of waste, but also that that would tackle many of the problems. The question is, where would that come from? I mean, here's somebody, Matt Morgan, Dr. Matt Morgan, in fact, three ways to make a health service affordable. So question coming in, tax more like Denmark, ration like the French, or collaborate with industry like Australia. The UK seems to do all three, mm. right? It does tax more, it does ration more, and it does collaborate with industry, but it isn't honest or transparent about it. Which path should we choose? And don't say improve efficiency. <laughs> um, you've, you've got all these debates, which, which we've had. Um, Philip Lee, who was a conservative MP with me and then became a Lib yeah. Dem, was a, a GP from, that was the MP for Bracknell. I mm. think, unless I'm being unfair to him, was one of a number of MPs on the health committee and others who suggested that people should be charged a, a nominal amount for appointments with GPs because there are these very, very large numbers of people just not turning up to appointments. And I think that's true in some of the health systems around the world, which is that mm. you do need to pay a small amount um, to access it. And I guess their assumption is psychologically that might make you think a bit more carefully before missing your appointment. Where, where are you on all this stuff at the moment? Well, we, I mean, part of the problem with the UK is that we sort of, we want um, 
if, if, if you like, Europe, the best European levels of public service, but we want an American approach to tax, as it were. Um, and the truth is you probably can't have both. I, 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 where I'm with you, and to a lesser extent with Sajid Javid, I do think that there has to be some kind... I think the base... I think Jim Down is right. The basic system is fine and the principle is fine. And by the way, I went to... See, Fiona and I went to see uh, Nye, the play about Nye Bevan at the National yep. Theatre the other day. And my God, it is brilliant. Michael Sheen is an absolute amazing actor. But it's a fantastic reminder of... You know, we, we talked in the interview with Anthony Gormley. He was bemoaning the lack of imagination in politics and it's the lack of imagination that leads us to downgrade the arts is the lack of imagination that leads to brexit the the power of the imagination of the idea that that that, that labor government had of a health service free at the point of of use regardless of the uh, free at the point of need regardless of the ability to pay and the drive and determination that it took to make it come about uh, it's a brilliant play but it's also a fantastic story and i think it's a reminder that we do need to keep those high levels of imagination of, of what is possible. Um, but I, I think, that, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with there being some kind of cross-party commission approach to review the, the workings of the health service with a view to improving it and with a view properly to exploiting the advantages of technology. Um, I was talking to a doctor the other day who said that some of the stuff that they're seeing in relation to cancer care and the AI and the development of technology is, is mind-blowingly brilliant. So I think there can be both of these things going on, but I'd be very, very loath to, to dismiss the strength and the power of that founding principle of the health service. Now, Rory, yep. can I give you this one? We, we talked very, very briefly about this in the main podcast in the context of the flag. Yep. Bobby O'Malley, last week, DWP released high, record highs of children in profit, poverty, but it's basically been ignored by most news media why is it that they've just got so used to it or are they just so far away from understanding the consequences of this that it doesn't seem that important? Polly Purvis quoted from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, the number of people in households at risk of being unable to afford enough food has risen by 53% in a year from 4.7 million to 7.2 million. And I, I mean, we are talking there, we're talking about millions of people who are really, really, really struggling. And they, it seems to me they have no next to no voice on the media at all. So why don't we cover that stuff? Two, two things on that. And just, I'll come back to your thing in a second. But I, clearly the, the main responsibility for this must lie with the conservative government. Right? They've been in government for 13 years. And a lot of these poverty indicators are going absolutely in the wrong direction. And we, we should dig into that and look at, look at the mistakes they've made. But the reason it's not getting in the news is partly that Labour has not decided to make this an issue. We, we talked in the main podcast about that speech given by Rachel Reeves, and she barely mentions poverty. I think she mentions mm. it three times, one in a historical context and, and one in a sort of much more abstract context. It, it's So before we get on to um, what can be done to sort it out and what the Tories are doing wrong, why has Labour given this shocking news and given that Labour is absolutely on the side of equality and progressive politics, why has Labour not made more of this? Mm. I, uh, well, it's a very, very good question. Um, I, and and I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer. Are they thinking that if they're just seen as the people who bang on about poor people, it loses that sense of, of aspiration? But I think you can do both. I think you can do both. I think you have to do both because the sort of economy that Rachel Reeves was talking about you know, she she did talk, for example, about the fact that post-COVID in particular, there's been this sort of huge surge of economically inactive people, people on disability benefits and so forth. And she's talked about the need to, 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 to you know, to reverse that, that trend. But the cost of poverty now is astronomical, even if it is the voluntary sector that's picking up a lot of the pieces. But I think Labour should make more of this. I really do. I think that you can't have... I saw that um, it was... I mean, there was a thing on German television the other day, on ARD. Uh, it was a long report about shoplifting in Leeds. And we should put it in the newsletter because there's a subtitled version that's doing the rounds. And it's stuff that... Honestly, it was the sort of stuff and the kind of interviews. You just, I just can't remember the last time I saw anything like that on British television. It was talking to these guys in a pub who were, who were talking about, you know, they were saying that 
They know so many families who've been touched by suicide. They know so many families who, who, who literally can't afford to eat or heat at the same time. And, and then they were talking to these um, people who were shopkeepers who were losing so much to shoplifting every day. And it just seems to me that it's absent from our political debate. And I think you're right. I think I, I, I probably, I'm too quick to blame the media sometimes for not covering it, but they probably would cover it more if there was like a Labour Party campaign on this. Gordon Brown, to be fair to him, Gordon Brown bangs on about child poverty as he did in government. He bangs on about it all the time. He's right. Yeah. And I think there's also this issue that everybody gets confused about differences between absolute poverty measured one way, relative poverty, which is about the gaps between between mm. people. But there are certain kinds of statistics that you could use to bring it home more. So I was talking yeah, to... Absolutely talking to a man who is um, one of the senior people at Iceland Foods, and he talked about the fact that they can see moments in their statistics, a big uprise in people shoplifting uh, milk powder, baby milk powder. And mm -hmm. those are mm -hmm. difficult to, to explain away, except in terms of people in absolutely desperate situations. I mean, it's not a normal thing to to shoplift and you can just see it in the figures in supermarkets that's very interesting because that was one of the things that this report this german report figured uh, featured was that was yeah. the was the rise in the theft of nappies and baby food yeah um, and this is this is also goes to a, uh, an issue that labor's been for some reason that i don't well no i can understand why but hasn't been prepared to challenge so the conservatives have imposed a two-child limit on benefits and the idea yeah. is that yeah. they're worried that people have more kids to get more benefits um, the, the problem with those limits is even if it's true that there are a few people who might have more kids to get benefits, the impact on large families who have more than two kids who are living in poverty is unbelievable and it's brutal. Yeah. And I think Labour traditionally would always have challenged that kind of policy and they're not yet challenging it. And, and one would like to see them challenge it because, uh, again, the answer to this, I'm afraid brutally, is cash. You need to give cash to poor people so that they can uh, meet their immediate needs and priorities. And that mm. extends to feeding their kids, clothing themselves, making sure that kids are in school. Um, and again, we need to challenge this ludicrous idea, which is shown in all the data and research to be false, that giving cash to people just encourages dependency and idleness. In fact, there's such good evidence from randomized control trials across the developing world, across the developed world, that the most straightforward way to tackle poverty is, I'm afraid, to make people less poor. Yeah. There's a, there's a, um, uh, there was a conference last week in Liverpool, and there's a guy called David Taylor Robinson, who's a professor, expert in public health. And he was talking about children who were turning up to school with no shoes, he was talking about children who were sharing their only meal of the day with their brothers and sisters. And he was saying that in Liverpool, uh, infant mortality is on the rise. Um, so these are all signs of something far bigger than the political or media debate are prepared to countenance. And I just do not understand why. And it's all part of this sort of denial of the real world. We deny that Brexit's damaging the economy. We deny that We've got all sorts of sort of so structural social problems that have that have in, that have driven inequality, and if we don't admit them, we're never going to address them. I, and and I think there's a bigger issue in the way that we think about politics, which is that we think a lot in terms of economic numbers, but we also yeah. need to talk about basic decency. I think Tessa Giles said once in a speech, and it really stuck with me that. When she went into a hospital, she'd ask herself, you know, would I want my mother to be in this hospital? And I began mm. thinking about it with prisons. You know, would I want my you know, sister or brother to be in, in this prison? And it's true on poverty, too, that we need to have a sense of just how shameful this is, how lacking in decency, that ask yourself, would you want to invite someone from another country? Would you be proud of Britain if you showed them the conditions in which the extreme poor in Britain are living, or the conditions in which prisoners are living? And the answer is absolutely the not. And no. we need to get absolutely. that sense of decency again. Absolutely. Now, Rory, I'm sorry to keep throwing questions at you, but we did seem to get a lot of questions pointed at you this week. Jack Harback, <laughs> Rory seems to think that we, brackets the Lib Dems, are in trouble. 
Yet, if our strategy pays off, we could be looking at around 50 MPs at the next, next election. Why is he always so pessimistic about us? And we do want to return to the single market after all, says Jack. And that's one of your things. Well, um, why am I <laughs> pessimistic? I'm pessimistic because uh, I don't feel that they are defining anything interesting in terms of national policy at the moment. I mean, you, you, you're right that there's very little coming out of Labour because they've got a kind of ming vast strategy. They're trying to be careful before an election. That should open huge space for the Lib Dems to talk about all these issues, mm. talk about poverty, be much more radical on rejoining the European Union. I mean, there's, there's tens of millions of voters out there looking for ideas, and there's a real sense of a sort of stale establishment consensus that the Lib Dems could be blowing apart, and they're not doing mm. it. Mm. All right, here's another one for you. Oh, blimey. <laughs> go on, I want one for you. Come on, look, before you come to me, here's one for okay. you. Okay, yeah, go on then. Throw one at me then. Paul Cowley, MB. In today's society with a labour shortage, cost of living crisis, public spending cuts, crime costing around £18 billion a year, businesses struggling in so many ways, why don't more UK businesses look at employing men and women from prisons? Statistics prove they're more loyal, ex-prisoners are more loyal, their retention figures are better, and they take less time off work. So he's mm. writing from an organization that's employed 130 prison leavers over the last 15 months. I think that's ICE and supermarkets. And that's, that's just the beginning. So, but why is more of this not going on? I think, I, think there are, it, 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 I, I agree with the premise, by the way. I think we still have a, a kind of view of people who've been to prison that that sort of marks them for life, and that is wrong. Um, we're just around the corner from where, where we live, there's, a, there's a, this place, Redemption Roasters, which is a a cafe, and uh, I think they're now developing into a chain, and the, the, it's called Redemption Roasters because the people who work there are people who have, you know, come out of prison. We've talked before about the clink, and, and in fact, we've both met prison governors recently who are keen for us, because we both talk about prison so much, to go and do um, a live podcast, either in a prison or at the clink, one of the restaurants, whatever it might be, which we would love to do. And I think the Department of Justice might have quibbles about it, but if they do, we'd love it even more if we could do it with the Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk. Yeah, we'd love to interview the Justice Secretary. So there we are. Shout out to Alex Chalk if you're listening to this on your run and shout out to the Minister of Justice. Can we please interview him in a prison and get onto the subject of prisons? And I also think that the point about loyalty is incredibly important. Um, I, I, I feel the same in this about, about mental health. I think that people who've got, gone through mental health crises and mental illness, I think sometimes if they admit that in an interview or as, on a CV, it's held against them. But I think it should be held in their favour. I think there's a, want... there's a, there's a, just, just quickly on that one, people may have heard of something called ban the box in this, which is that you... Instead of getting people to tick a box whether they have a criminal conviction right before they even get an interview, which often means they never make it through, it takes that box out, interviews, and then later in the process, once you've had a chance to see someone and get sense of their strengths and weaknesses, then you find out whether or not they've had a criminal conviction. Oh, okay, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, so look, there's no doubt. And of course, what will happen is that you know, you might get an isolated incident of somebody who employs somebody out of prison and they end up, you know, raiding the till or whatever or beating somebody up and, and people say, oh, this is terrible, this is why you should never... But that happens in real life anyway and it happens with prison, people who have not been to prison as well. But I just think we've got to... We've got to you talk about being a more civilised society. Part of being a civilised society is to give people second, even third, even fourth chances. And I think that it would also... If we had a business culture that thought about wanting to take people who, who are serving to, towards the end of their sentences, it would also change the culture inside prisons as well. Um, so there's a kind of, I think there's a win-win there. Now, Rory, here's one for you. This is my last yep. one. Theresa McCrone. Rory, if you were London mayor, would you build housing on golf courses? <laughs> London's golf courses add up to an area the size of Wandsworth and they're used by a tiny minority of people. Well, the problem with that, it's a lovely, Be lovely brave, line. Rory, be brave. The, the, well, the challenge around it is, is, um, is that this is Greenbelt stuff. A lot of those golf courses are on Greenbelt. Um, and I do think that it's going to be very, very dangerous if we start digging hard into the Greenbelt because I think we will then end up with sprawling megacities and you'll basically have... I'm afraid. I mean, you can see this already in bits of Hampshire. 
just a sense of urban sprawl going on and on and on. What London needs to do is uh, build up and not, not skyscrapers. We talked about this before. Medium density, six, nine story buildings. We need to be much better at giving planning permission for that. I also would like to see, I mean, I'd like to get rid of the golf courses. Absolutely get rid of all golf courses, but I'd like to replace them <laughs> with forest. I want you the green get, belt You want to, to get be, rid of all golf courses? Yeah, I'm going to go anti-golf. Um, but what I'd like the green belt to become is the largest forest in England. I'd like hundreds of millions of trees planted in the green belt. I think it would transform our carbon targets. It would transform air quality in London. It would transform nature and access for young people, particularly the urban poor, and justify the green belt instead of what it is at the moment, which is a lot of yeah. wasteland okay. and golf courses. Good. Right. Give you the last question. No, last one, last one for you. Why do you think there's been such underreporting on the election of a new first minister in Wales, especially compared to Scotland? Does it reflect the way Wales is seen by the rest of the UK? What are your predictions for the way Welsh Labour will go under Vaughan Gething? I don't think it's... I mean, I, I think it got a fair bit of coverage, did it not? I think that, you know, we talked about it last week. I think that I certainly saw his... Um, his acceptance speech, I saw his first, I heard about his first uh, presentation as first minister. I saw coverage of Mark Drakeford's very moving departure speech. So I, I don't think it was that low profile. Um, but I think Scotland is a, is a bigger country. Uh, I think it's probably been more interesting in terms of the politics, because in recent years, it's been central to the UK debate because we had the independence referendum. Salmon and Sturgeon in particular have been absolutely UK household names, not just in Scotland. Whereas I guess because Wales has been Labour, 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 uh, less kind of volatile. And that's probably explains why it doesn't get quite the same level of, of coverage. Isn't that right? That's uh, good. Uh, and I, I'm also, I'm, I'm going to be dishonest by asking you, Tim Buckle, anything cheery this week? Other than the Labour land side, I'm a regular listener and it's all been a bit doom and gloom recently. Mm, so just to give mm. you a second while you think of something cheery. Um, I had a really interesting uh, dinner, says he name dropping massively. Uh, Will with, I am. Will, Will I am, exactly. <laughs> um, in my house this week. And he's been doing a lot on AI. AI on music, AI on radio, AI on cars. He was showing me some of the new applications he's developed. And it really is incredible. If you get the prompts right, the designs right, the tools right, just how much AI is now able to do. And actually, you know, I talk a lot about ChatGBT. Um, despite grumbling about Gemini, which is the Google app, it's also mm. doing some amazing thing on, on things on creative uh, writing at the moment. So I, I'm, I, and you talked about health. I, I think the possible applications, again, I had a meeting three weeks ago in New York with a man who is um, designing new vaccines using AI, um, AI mm -hmm. at four different stages in four different countries, and then synthesizing them, you know, and this is happening right across the world. He's got stuff going in Canada, Rory, the Rory, US. Rory, Rory, yep. Rory, 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 yep. Rory, let's just get off vaccines. I think quite a lot of our listeners will be thinking, hold on a minute, Rory Stewart had Will I Am in his house. One, my first question is, did you know who he was? Two, <laughs> what, what, two who did the cooking? And three, what did you have? Uh, we got takeaway Indian. Uh, because right. he turned out, turned out to be a vegetarian. I got in a real muddle because I got it from a, a lovely Indian restaurant called Dashoom, but their, their biryani was so convincing that he and I convinced ourselves that maybe we'd been sent chicken instead of jackfruit, and I had to keep okay. munching my way through it to work out what okay. it was. So that, okay. Did I really know who I, he was? Not, not, not really, no. But you, of course, <laughs> of course <laughs> did know who he was. I did, I did. Yeah. Go I on, did. give us your good news for the week. Well, I had a fantastic day yesterday because I got approached out of the blue by a, a rock, an indie rock band from Wales. See, we talk about Wales all the time, um, called Cardinal Black, and I was the only people, I was the only person they knew who, or they'd heard of, who played the bagpipes. Ah. And so they asked, they asked me if I would do the play. They, they'd written this song which they felt needed bagpipes in the background. So I spent the day in the recording studio. 
And uh, particularly on the day that we had Anthony Gormley on leading, um, I just felt so sort of part of something wonderfully creative. Oh. Um, and I, I'm really, I'm going to bang on about this Britain as a cultural superpower until it happens, because I think that, I think the arts are going to be, I love that thing Anthony Gormley said about, you know, if AI is going to take all our jobs away, we're all going to have to be artists. Yeah. So, so for a day, I felt like I was a bit of a, a bit of a rock star and I quite, quite enjoyed it. I think that's amazing. And it, of course it's, it's a luxury for us, but it makes such a difference. My my really good friend, Emma, in Yale, um, I hope she doesn't mind me dropping her name in, but she's taken up ceramics and pottery classes. And I just think it's just bringing so much happiness to her life, um, making pots three hours good. a week. So good. there we are. Good. Shout out for Anthony Gormley. Thank you, Alistair. Excellent. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>